Good evening, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience and thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Caribbean Israel Leadership Coalition Summit. We are very much appreciative that you have taken the time out of your busy schedule to join us this evening for this inaugural historic summit between Israel and Caribbean evangelical leaders, lay preachers, pastors, and friends of Israel. My name is Jennifer Highland. I'm the Vice President of Caribbean Israel Leadership Coalition Caribbean, and I will be your co-host this evening. This evening's theme is the Abraham Accords, a new Middle East, and joining us are our esteemed panelists. I will introduce them, but just to let you know who they are, His Excellency's Ambassador Zvital, Zvital the Ambassador of Israel to Mexico, accredited to the Bahamas and Belize. His Excellency Ambassador Dr. Andre Thomas, Ambassador at Large for the Kingdom of St. Penn and UN Peace Ambassador, and he's also the President of Caribbean Israel Leadership Coalition. We also have joining us Ambassador, His Excellency Ambassador Dr. C.B. Peter Morgan, and my co-host this evening is Mr. Nadab Cohen, he's the Deputy Chief of Missions. I will introduce all the speakers, I will be reading their bios so you can get familiar with them for the sake of time and we will just flow into this evening's proceedings. You will also have an opportunity to ask questions in the question and answer segment and we will let you know when that opportunity will be presented uh, itself later on in the program. But let me take the time now to introduce our speakers and our panelists. Uh, I would introduce my co-host, I will let you know who he is, and that is Mr. Nadav uh, Warren. He has been working at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He has been working at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, representing Israel for over seven years before arriving in Mexico. He spent five years in at the Embassy of Israel in Nigeria, where he served as Deputy Chief of Mission. Before that, he practiced law as he is a lawyer from the Georgetown University and he's barred in both Israel and the United States. Ambassador Vital is the ambassador of Israel to Mexico, accredited to the Bahamas and Belize. He at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he obtained a law degree and a master's degree in a master's degree in political science. He served as second secretary, press and information attaché at the Israeli embassy in Brussels, as well as first secretary for political affairs at the same embassy. He also served as counselor at the Israeli embassy to the Holy See, Rome, as the deputy head of mission for the European Union in Brussels and deputy head of the mission at the Israeli embassy in Paris. From 2015 to 2019, he worked in Israel at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as the director of international organizations, specialized agencies, and global affairs, and as the deputy head of missions of the Division for Europe. I will now read the bio of his ambassador, Dr. Andre Thomas. His Excellency Ambassador Dr. Andre Thomas is a movement leader with a notable prophetic and apostolic for changing the trajectory of the church and its nations towards greatness. His life's purpose is to represent the move of God that takes people, leaders, the church, economies, and nations from bondage to greatness. He is the ambassador for the Kingdom of St. Penn, and he is also a United Nations Peace Ambassador. He has worked in for over 34 years planting churches, holding prophetic miracle events, great disempowerment events, and building Bible colleges globally. He is the founder of Fresh Anointing, a global organization with a mission to raise up a wise virgin church to meet the Lord at his appearing. The organization subsidiary assembly, an international network of prophetic assemblies, bondage to greatness. The greatness he also 
the founder of the Greatness Channel, a 24 seven empowerment global television station, the Wisdom International Ministerial Alliance, a global network of leading ministries of the gospel. He's also the founder of College of Visionaries. He's also the founder of College of Visionaries, an international network of Bible colleges, greatness publishing and international publishing company. He's also the founder of Caribbean Israel Leadership Coalition, which is a network of Caribbean and Israeli governmental and business leaders advancing Israel's strategic interests interest, and building sustainable economic development in the Caribbean. And he's also the founder of the Ideas and Solutions Group, which is an organization that provides financing, strategy consulting, and executive coaching to take governmental and business ideas and solutions from concept to reality. He's also the founder of the Caribbean Israel Group, which includes Caribbean Israel Venture Services Incorporated, a company that mines and develops the resources in the people, lands, and seas of sovereign nations. For their economic dignity, Caribbean Israel Finance is also a company that provides brokered financing for development projects, and Caribbean Impact Trust, a company that provides funding for economic development projects. Dr. Andre Thomas is a prolific author of 26 books that cover leadership, spiritual development, and the transformation of nations. He's married to his soulmate, prophetess Nina Thomas, and they have two daughters. At this time, I would want to introduce our first speaker who will greet you and say a few words, and that would be His Excellency, Dr. C.B. Peter Morgan. He is a board director for Caribbean Israel Leadership Coalition. And let me just introduce him. And once I'm finished, he will come on and he will greet you for a few minutes. His Excellency, Dr. C.B. Peter Morgan is an accomplished pastor and educator of many years. Born and grown in Jamaica, he oversees many churches within the Caribbean and the USA. He currently is an adjunct lecturer at the Caribbean Nazarene College in Santa Cruz, Trinidad, and at the Graduate School of Theology in Kingston, Jamaica. Dr. Morgan is the president of the International Association of Kingdom Churches and Ministries, IAKCM, a global network of Christian leaders and ministers. He is a founding director and immediate past president of the International Third World Leaders Association, ITWLA with headquarters in Nassau, Bahamas. He has been widely consulted with nations and churches as a global statesman, fathering nations. His major conviction is that fathers dream dreams and their sons build cities. As Bishop Dr. Morgan gives oversight to his son's churches in Kingston, Jamaica, and to other across the Caribbean, as well as to members of the Jamaican diaspora. Dr. Morgan is the author of the nation's God's strategic purpose for establishing your nation and the city church a personal pilgrimage. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce to the microphone His Excellency Dr. C.B. Peter Morgan to greet you. Dr. Peter Morgan. Thank you so very much. Uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Ambassador Zivi Tal and Honorable uh, Navad, it is our joy and our privilege really to uh, be hosting and uh, co-hosting this tremendous summit. Actually, we really believe that the Jewish community from its very inception in antiquity up until today is really one of, if not the most significant culture that the world has ever seen. And I'm saying that because we are very conscious that from the outset of the initiation of your nation, you were, you had the approval of Almighty God. And as a matter of fact, it was said from then that you were being established to be an example to the nations of the world. Now we know you're not perfect, and we know that uh, in spite of shortcomings and all of that, as a matter of fact, you, your history has shown that you have been absorbed 
by so many nations. And in a sense, it's like you were lost in the nations of the world over these many, many centuries. And all that you have been through, I believe, is only an example of the fact that still today, the fact that you have reemerged as a nation, and not just as a stripling nation, but in fact, one of the leading nations of the world, you are still an example nation to the nations of the world. And so in the Caribbean, we really value you. And uh, you are in fact, part of the, the heritage of our peoples and the history of the Caribbean. You have played a signal part in, in our growth and in our development and in our culture. But more significantly is the fact that we as a people with a strong faith-based uh, conviction, we really regard you as a people, the Israelis, the, the Jewish community as part of our heritage. And in fact, we were birthed from out of the faith of your fathers. And so today, I want you to know that you have our support, the Caribbean Israel Leaders Coalition uh, is very thankful and appreciative of all that you have done as a people in committing yourself to the Caribbean to help us to grow in uh, reasserting ourselves as a people, economically and socially, and uh, in our security and in our cyber uh, technology and in so many different ways, you have already made a signal contribution to the growth and development of our peoples. So as we come together, we are in fact uh, very positive about the future. And part of why we are positive about the future is because we continue to uh, associate with you and your peoples in, in Israel and uh, as a Jewish culture, we believe that God has his hand still upon you and upon us all together. So the, what we're discussing tonight, the Abraham Accord is a sign, I believe, of something that is very positive and something that we would like to see continue to work, not only in the Middle East, but I believe it will have, and it, it does have, in fact, global significance. So thanks very much for uh, all that you contribute to our peoples in the Caribbean. And we can assure you that as a people of faith and as a, a, a region, in fact, we want to give you all the encouragement and all the support. The world is better because of the culture of the Jewish people. Thanks again. And we look forward to the discussion tonight. Thank you very much, His Excellency, Dr. Peter Morgan for your introductory remarks. At this time, I'm going to hand over to my co-host, Deputy Chief of Mission, for the Embassy of Israel in Mexico, Mr. Nadav Koren, and he will be our facilitator for the summit topics this evening. And so I'm going to hand over to Nadav Koren, Deputy Chief of Mission. Mr. Nadav. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Highland. Um, let me say a few words of opening and then we can move uh, into the topic. So uh, Ambassador Sital, Ambassador Thomas, Dr. Morgan, Ms. Highland, and all the honorable guests here tonight. Uh, in the challenging times of a global pandemia, uh, pandemic, it is natural to seek out beacons of hope and optimism. Today in our discussion, we will focus on the Abraham Accords and the, and the normalization process in the Middle East, which are actually, in reality, lighting the path to a better future in the region. On September 15th, one year ago, Israel, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain signed the U.S. brokered peace and normalization agreements with Israel known as the Abraham Accords. Following the signing of these accords, Israel reached a normalization agreement with Sudan on October 23rd, 2020, 
and later on a normalization agreement with Morocco on December 10th, 2020. As we celebrate a year to this formal initiation of this peace process uh, this week, the Embassy of Israel in Mexico, accredited to the Bahamas and Belize, together with its close partner, the Caribbean Israel Leadership Coalition, is happy to shed some more light and analyze this intriguing process in order to better understand its effects on the reality of Israel and the Middle East. I want to stress that we are very excited to speak to an audience of Christian leadership from all across the Caribbean region. Your support for the state of Israel in good times and in more challenging times is very much recognized and appreciated. Here at the embassy, we're working in various ways to enhance cooperation in the Caribbean region. This includes, among others, a two-year humanitarian intervention that we led in the Bahamas in the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian. This included an emergency res this response included an emergency response to the lack of potable water resulting from the hurricane, continued with professional water assessment missions, and concluded a few weeks ago after a new water management system was put into place in the islands of Grand Bahama and Abaco to prevent future scarcity of water due to hurricanes. In the area of health, we organized a public health briefing in, uh, for health officials from Caribbean community member states, CARICOM and CARPA, with the core objectives of sharing knowledge and lessons learned by the Israeli health authorities during Israel's successful COVID-19 vaccination campaign. We are currently working with CARICOM on collaborations in the areas of agriculture and cybersecurity. All this is to say that we, very much value our friends in the Caribbean region and will continue working hard to strengthen cooperation and future projects. This event tonight is another manifestation of our close friendship with Caribbean nations. And with no further ado, we will begin um, our discussion. I will go on to present the discussion topic. And for each topic, I will first invite Ambassador Tal to comment. And secondly, ask Ambassador Thomas to provide the Caribbean context. At the end, we will have, as mentioned, a, a questions and answer session. Um, and so, um, His Excellency Ambassador Tibital, um, I, I would like to ask you to perhaps start with a brief history, history of the conflict in the Middle East in order to give us context uh, for the discussion about normalization and peace. Thank you, Nadav. Uh, before I start, uh, allow me to... Uh, Thank from the bottom of my heart, uh, Dr. Morgan, for his kind words. Um, it's very inspiring. It's very demanding also. And since you uh, mentioned uh, our shortcomings, I hope that uh, I'll rise to the expectation of uh, the summit of this evening. Uh, it's nice also to greet uh, uh, an old friend, if I might use that terminology, Dr. Thomas. Uh, we've been together just a couple of weeks ago on uh, your TV program, and I really hope that uh, very soon we'll be able to meet in the flesh. So um, Nadav uh, asking me to uh, present a brief history of the conflict in the Middle East is uh, uh, quite a challenge. Uh, so um, I did prepare a, kind of a summary um, of uh, main uh, events, and uh, let's go through it uh, as rapidly as we can. And if needed, we'll be able to uh, expand and elaborate um, further on. So let me start with uh, 1947, the 29th of uh, November, which is uh, the uh, date of the adoption of the partition plan or the uh, resolution 181 by the General Assembly of the UN calling for the establishment of, and I quote, a Jewish state and an Arab state, and also providing for a special status for Jerusalem. Now, I started with this um, date, with this uh, important event, although uh, one could argue that uh, conflict actually began uh, many decennia before, uh, let's say in the uh, 80s of the century before, the 19th century, uh, with confrontations between uh, new Jewish immigrants arriving to uh, Palestine and the local Arab residents. 1948, the 14th of May, a date familiar to each and every one of you, I guess, the Declaration of Independence. And the day after, on the 15th of May, the 
attack by Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, the rescue army and the Holy Jihad army, the local Arab population, which started the, the war of independence. Let me jump now to 1956. On the 29th of, of, of October, sorry, started the um, Suez crisis, which evolved in the Sinai war. Um, and uh, the war went on until the 7th of November of that same year, 1956. 1964 of June, so the establishment of the Palestine Liberation Organization. 1967, fifth, between the 5th of June and the 10th of June uh, was the Six Days War. And on the 22nd of November of 1967, a very important UN Security Council resolution was adopted, known henceforth as Resolution 242. 1967 still, the presence of the PLO in Lebanon down to the south and in 19, 1968, and then in 1975, a civil war erupted in Lebanon. In 1970, to come back to, to 1970, December, in September 1970, until July 1971, Black September, a uh, Palestinian terrorist organization, tried to throw down the Hashemite uh, kingdom uh, uh, authorities. 1973, October, the Yom Kippur War, 22nd of October, another important UN Security Council resolution, 338, which became together with 242, a reference in future peace negotiations. 22nd of November, 74, UN General Assembly adopts resolution 23236 regarding the refugees issue. 1978, on the 17th of September, the signing of the Camp David Accords, the framework for peace in the Middle East, providing also something that is less known for an autonomy for the Palestinians. So already embedded in that agreement was the part dedicated to the issue of the Palestinians and granting them autonomy. The other parts talked about relations between Israel and Egypt, obviously, and normalization. The second accord that was signed was the framework for the signing of the peace agreement between Egypt and Israel. 1982, 6th of June, peace to Galilee operation, what was later branded as the first Lebanon war against the Palestinian terrorist organizations in Lebanon. Henceforth, the PLO moves to Tunis. 1987, the first Intifada started on the 8th of December and lasted until the 13th of September, 1993. 1991, the Madrid Conference, from the 30th of October until the 1st of November, 1991, where an Israeli delegation participated along a Syrian delegation, a Jordanian delegation, a Lebanese delegation, sorry, a, de a Syrian delegation, Lebanese delegation, and a joint Palestinian Jordanian delegation. 1993, on the 9th of September, there was an exchange of letters between Chairman Arafat of the PLO and late Prime Minister Rabin regarding mutual recognition. So from that day on, the PLO became the legitimate representative of the Palestinian people in the eyes of the Israeli authorities. 13th of September, four days later, at the White House, the signing of the Oslo agreements, the creation of the Palestinian Authority. So 28 years ago, this milestone was set in the relations between Israel and the Palestinians. 1994, 
26th of October, the signing of a peace agreement between Israel and Jordan. 1997, on the 15th of January, Hebron Agreement was signed, dividing the city into two different parts known as H1 and H2. Additional agreements regarding our relations with the Palestinian people. In 1998, the Y River Memorandum. In 1999, the Shah Meshech Agreement. In 2000, there was a renewed effort to relaunch our negotiations with the Palestinians, again at Camp David this time under the leadership of President Clinton, together with Chairman Arafat and the Israeli Prime Minister at the time, Ehud Barak. In 2000, just a couple of months later, in September, the second Intifada started, known as the Al-Quds Intifada. 2001, January, Taba Conference, where the Clinton roadmap for a solution between Israel and the Palestinian Authority was adopted, 2002, in March, the Arab Peace Initiative adopted by the Arab League Summit. 2002, in June, the Roadmap to Peace, President Bush and the Quartet. 2003, in June, Aqaba Conference. 2005, in Sharm el Sheikh, a summit where Israel, the Palestinian Authority, Egypt, and Jordan joined and brought an end to the Second Intifada. From there, of course, we jump to more recent history, to last year, to the Abraham Accords, the accord, the agreement signed with Sudan and the agreement signed with Morocco, which my deputy Nadav has already mentioned. That concludes the summary. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for that in-depth uh, summary of so many events. And uh, please, uh, Ambassador Thomas, uh, if we could uh, receive your comments as well. Okay. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Uh, that was a thorough explanation uh, of the uh, peace process. And uh, one of the first things that uh, really um, occurred to me, even though I've studied this, there has definitely been significant effort to bring peace. And when you look at the process, it is obvious that significant effort has been made by the US administration, significant effort by the Israeli successive Israeli governments, and also uh, there, there has been significant attacks against Israel. And there, there also has been the creation of institutions to represent the Palestinian people. And there also has been significant effort to normalize relationships with Israel's neighbors. So uh, what would have happened if we did not have the law of intention? It's very clear that where we are right now is because there was a lot of intention. And uh, I really believe that uh, those who insinuate or actually have propaganda, that this is not the case. When you hear the facts, it is very, very obvious that intentionally, um, uh, successive Israeli administrations, successive US administrations have worked to create peace within the Middle East. And uh, we are very excited about the breakthrough that occurred last year with the Abraham Accords. I, I, I really believe it's, uh, it's one of the best things that has ever happened. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Thomas. Now going to our, our next topic, and, uh, and Ambassador, if you can start on the backdrop of the history that, that you that you just uh, went over, um, could you could you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the significance of the peace accords and the normalization uh, processes in the context of the Palestinian question? As a, you know, many people view it as 
as the, the most central uh, question that we're facing today in the Middle East. So uh, could you give a few comments about that? Yes, Nadav, definitely. Um, let me say at the outset that actually the Palestinian issue was always at the center of attention of the Arab and Muslim world. Actually, to be frank and maybe not so diplomatic, but I, I, I allow myself to be very open and frank uh, in, in, in this uh, event and with this uh, assistance. Uh, actually, that was the only issue that the Arab League could uh, reach a consensus on. And uh, this is why um, from 1967, when the Arab League summit in Khartoum, Sudan's capital, adopted the famous resolutions of the three no's, no uh, to peace with Israel, no to recognition with Israel, and no uh, to negotiations with Israel. From that day on, there was a boycott uh, there was a uh, political warfare, and of course, later on also uh, aggressions against Israel. And um, the real challenge was to uh, decouple the uh, Palestinian issue from uh, the advances in negotiating uh, settlements and peace agreements with uh, the different uh, Arab neighbors. We uh, succeeded, as I already mentioned, when it came to uh, Egypt, but that was thanks to the courage of an Egyptian leader, president, known as uh, Anwar Sadat, who paid very dearly this uh, uh, courageous step he took because he was uh, later on assassinated by uh, Islamists in Egypt. Um, and actually no other country followed suit uh, until we uh, reached the uh, um, Camp David Accord, which opened the way to the peace agreement with Jordan, to the opening of um, uh, representations, uh, usually uh, commercial representations in many of the uh, um, Gulf countries, even in Mauritania, in Nouakchott, and also in Rabat, we reach an agreement eventually uh, with the Moroccans uh, that was severed in 2000 after the second Intifada. So the uh, Palestinian issue um, became uh, the uh, core issue in our relationship with the Arab and Muslim world. And any, any uh, attempt to promote an understanding between Israel and any other Arab neighbor or Arab country in the Middle East was taken hostage by the Israeli-Palestinian. And finally, last year, there was a paradigmal change in our relations because the uh, Gulf countries, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, and later on Sudan and also Morocco, decided to look at their own strategic interests and to see how best to promote them in a partnership with Israel, not forgetting about the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, of course, but not allowing this conflict to be the cornerstone in establishing their relations with the Jewish state. So this for me is the real significant change in our relationship with the Arab world. We are not anymore a, tolerate, a tolerated Zionist entity in this part of the world, but rather a legitimate partner in the eyes of all these countries with whom we have signed agreements, normalization and peace agreements, and actually also in the eyes of others that haven't so far signed such agreements. Let me just mention um, Saudi Arabia. And uh, let me add another note, a positive, very positive note to these agreements. Um, you know that when talking about the Israeli-Egyptian 
uh, peace agreement or even about the Israeli-Jordanian peace agreement, usually one tends to refer to cold agreements, meaning that uh, these are agreements between governments, governmental authorities with uh, uh, strategic uh, understandings and coordination uh, between uh, the um, uh, defense authorities of all these countries, but not between the peoples, not between the civil societies. And when, when it comes to these new agreements, it's a completely different ballgame. Here we are talking about a great variety of, um, of uh, corporations between academia, between institutions, between uh, the peoples themselves, um, and even uh, also regarding uh, interreligious and tolerance dialogue, something which is very close to the heart of the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. So this is a, a completely new chapter we are writing now in our relationship with the Arab and Muslim world. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, and please, I'll give the floor to uh, Ambassador Thomas. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I can really comment on this because I am I'm privileged to be on the non-advisory board of the Abrahamic Business Circle based in Dubai. Uh, and uh, so I have watched this uh, and that's a coming together of businessmen from Israel, businessmen from the Gulf states, and here's a businessman from the Caribbean and actually working together with all our roots in Abraham. <laughs> uh, we have our Christian roots in Abraham. Uh, they have the Islamic roots in Abraham and, and the Jewish roots are also in, in Abraham. So I am part of that organization. And what I believe is happening, and this is what I would, uh, I would uh, advocate to the Caribbean evangelicals that are listening, and there's some of you who have direct access to your prime ministers, direct access to your decision makers, is that a breakthrough has been reached in not looking at relationship with Israel primarily through the lens of the, the, the dialogue or the lack of dialogue between Israel and the Palestinians but to look at it in terms of your country's strategic interest. And sometimes I have felt that there are nations who don't really think it's their strategic interest to not have normal relations with Israel, but they feel they're somehow morally obligated to object and morally obligated to make a stance. And now you can highlight to them exactly what's happening. Because uh, in the Muslim world, within the Gulf states, there is a coming together, not just at the governmental level, but definitely at the level of the civil society. So the Abrahamic Accords were a breakthrough. And I believe that as you share and interact with your foreign policy decision makers, highlighting those facts are very important because there are many times you have very loud noises and uh, people making very loud statements uh, that are not born of inf that are not born of accurate information, but born out of propaganda. So it's very important that you understand really what's happening and the breakthroughs that are happening. Yes, those are my words. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Thomas. Um, in the next, the next uh, topic uh, I'd like to raise is, uh, and, and we'll start uh, again with Ambassador Tal. Can you talk maybe about the significance of the Abraham Accords about, about through the lens of, uh, of the geopolitical context in the Middle East. So through the Sunni Shia divide, through Iran's role in the region, what's the, the strategic significance through that lens? 
Yes, thank you again, Nadav, um, uh, for this uh, uh, various uh, And actually, you mentioned the uh, I would suggest to look at what's happening in the Arab and look at regimes which are caught in the past and look at more pragmatic regimes which are really examining possibilities improving the faith of that bull, improving conditions of life, improving the quality of life of their peoples in this part of the world. I uh, was thinking to myself, um, one of the main challenges in the world, now that we are uh, uh, witnessing the devastating effects of climate change, is the issue of water. And all the experts have already agreed long time ago that the next um, global or important region wars will probably be waged around the issue of the scarcity of water. Now, this is in whole humility, this is of course a, an area where we could um, be instrumental and, and Israel is willing to share its experience, its know-how, its technologies, uh, when uh, water, management of water, efficiency, etc. And uh, we have a long record which proves that indeed we have tried to reach out to our Arab neighbors. And I'm referring to what was called back in 1992 uh, the Barcelona process, and was later transformed by French President Sarkozy into the Union for the Mediterranean. This was a process launched by the European Union for the benefit of the countries and the peoples of the Mediterranean. And that actually was, at that time, the only forum where Israeli representatives, not only diplomat, also technician in different areas that were covered by that process, uh, were able to sit together their um, Arab counterparts. And again, what I concurred that so many efforts we deployed, so many um, um, good intentions that we then demonstrated, I must say, very little came out of uh, these encounters. So um, coming back to the real confrontation, I think that uh, we should um, reinforce this union of the pragmatic elements in the Arab and Muslim world, um, together with partners. Um, of course, the European Union is very much involved in what in these for uh, historical reasons. Uh, it's the biggest financier of the uh, uh, Palestinian uh, autonomy and the Palestinian people. Mm -hmm. Of course, looking at, at the US um, and try to um, transform this part of the world, uh, putting to good use technologies and uh, innovations and, and creative solutions to uh, the big challenges um, that we need to confront together. And that would be sending a very important message to the peoples that for the time being are being taken hostage by um, regimes like the regime of the Ayatollahs in Iran uh, and, and uh, other um, uh, regimes and, and non-state actors also uh, in, in the Arab world. Look at what's happening in, in Lebanon due to uh, the takeover of, of Hezbollah and look what might happen in Iraq uh, due to the presence of the uh, Shiite militias. 
So um, yes, we have strategic uh, challenges ahead. And Iran definitely, when it comes to Israel, is the biggest on uh, uh, regarding nuclear. So the uh, the division of the at least the uh, territorial axis that runs now from Tehran through Iraq, as I just mentioned, Syria, Lebanon, as said, uh, with uh, Hezbollah, and uh, uh, going through uh, Gaza. Uh, supporting not only the uh, uh, Palestinian Jihad, but also Hamas, which is a Sunni organization. And this is why at the outset, uh, Nadav, I said that I really don't believe anymore in the Sunni Shia divide, but in the uh, 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 more advanced. Yeah, I think I, I think we can't hear uh, hear you, Ambassador. Um, so um, until you reconnect, uh, maybe can we hear comments from Ambassador Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Now, uh, I, I really loved what the ambassador was really sharing because uh, I, I love uh, the subject of that geopolitics. And when you really look at the geopolitics of the Middle East and the Arab world, um, there are different uh, now groupings. Uh, you have uh, the groupings of, say, the Gulf states. And, uh, and that would be the UAE, that would be Bahrain, and uh, their policy and their thinking and their approach to Israel is that of a strategic partner. I mean, then you have, uh, and, and, and you have in those nations, you have uh, a actual um, uh, working with Israel, not just at the uh, governmental level, but you have working with Israel at the um, at the the uh, civil society, and then you have nations like Jordan and Egypt and uh, Morocco, and uh, and so you have uh, Sudan, and and so you have different dynamics, and then you go to nations that are outwardly hostile. So it's, I think it's very, very important for any um, evangelical that is seeking to advocate greater ties to understand that the Arab world right now does not have a unified position where Israel is concerned. <laughs> that the different groupings of nations uh, that have their own policies and, and have their own perspectives. And that uh, what we should emphasize is we should emphasize on the nations that have normalized relationships and nations that are seeking active partnerships and, and really promote that when we start to share with our governments and also with our churches and with and with our populations, uh, on 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 why Israel is a great partner, absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much, Ambassador Thomas. And I'm gonna I'm gonna just see if we hear the ambassador. Ambassador, do you hear us? I think I see you are on mute. That's right. Sorry. How is it? Ah. Now? Okay. Yes. I'm, yes. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador. We're glad you're back. And we're on to the, the last topic. Um, I'm going to ask you to be a, like, like a weatherman. I want, I want to hear the forecast. 
I will, um, <laughs> and we'll start. We'll start. We'll start with you, Ambassador Tal. What What do you think uh, um, is is your forecast for the, for for the peace agreement or for the normalization process in the region in the upcoming months, years? Will we see more people, more countries uh, joining? Will we Will we not? What is your opinion? Well, Nadav, this one is tricky, as you <laughs> understand yourself. Uh, it's really hazardous to make uh, forecasts in uh, geo strategic matters, and even more so when it comes to the Middle East. Uh, you know, just to refer to uh, uh, some uh, important events that uh, no one really uh, uh, was was prepared for. Um, talking about the uh, Iranian revolution, for example, in 1979. The Arabs Sadat's decision to come to Jerusalem and discuss peace with uh, Menachem Begin and the Israeli leadership at the time. Uh, the October or Yom Kippur War in 1973, probably the worst failure of our military intelligence. And uh, quite recently, the crumbling of the Afghan army and the swift takeover of the Taliban. Uh, but let me let me share some thoughts. Nevertheless, um, I would like to be optimistic. And um, as I said, um, mentioning Saudi Arabia, to me, it's clear that uh, uh, these um, important steps taken by United Arab Emirates and Bahrain wouldn't have they wouldn't have seen the day of light if it wasn't for uh, tacit uh, behind the scenes approval by Riyadh. Uh, now Saudi Arabia has not joined yet. Uh, I think it has is it's played full with the Houthis and with a change in the attitude of uh, the Biden administration. Um, as uh, compared with uh, a different attitude by the Trump administration towards uh, Saudi Arabia at the time. Um, but, uh, but it will happen. Uh, with regards to uh, the Biden administration, uh, now, of course, uh, it's very much concerned but by what has happened in Afghanistan, by the rapprochement between the Taliban regime and Iran, by uh, China uh, looking for opportunities in that part of the world. And of course, uh, with the uh, continuous challenges posed by Russia uh, in the Middle East. So, uh, and, and uh, uh, regarding Israel's strategic interests, of course, uh, Iran is at the center and we saw that in uh, the visit of Prime Minister ben uh, Bennett in Washington. So I think that all of these issues will um, side play uh, the uh, normalization. I think that um, the uh, Palestinian issue will come uh, back uh, into uh, um, our uh, uh, relations with uh, with the United States and with the European Union. Just the other day, Foreign Minister Yair Lapid came up with a, a new uh, plan for Gaza, uh, and this, of course, will um, uh, will will uh, uh, open up opportunities. But all the, the involvement of the United States and the European Union. So to uh, sum up, I would say in the um, uh, foreseeable future, the, the issues at hand will be Iran, will be the, devel the developments in Afghanistan and neighboring Pakistan and Iran again, and the Palestinian issue and um, the uh, um, normalization process uh, will be put, hopefully, for a, a very short period, on a, a black a back burner. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And um, uh, Ambassador Thomas, uh, please, for, for your comments on this uh, final topic before we go to Q&A. 
Okay. Well, I would uh, I would uh, agree with everything that uh, Ambassador has shared with us concerning his forecast for the Middle East. I would uh, give a forecast for the Caribbean uh, in terms of our relationships with, in terms of Israel. I believe that in the next years to come, that uh, there would be a greater um, interaction between the Caribbean and Israel uh, that would be reflected in more Israeli projects within the region. It also would be uh, reflected in uh, a significant influence of uh, Israeli leadership in our agriculture. I, I really believe that we're about to experience something major in this sector, because Israel was part of Caribbean agriculture after independence. And, uh, and so there is a great history there. And I believe that when it also comes to voting at the UN, I, I actually believe that we are progressively going to see more nations abstain or more nations vote in favor of Israel. But uh, I believe that the move is going to the, I believe that the dial is moving towards a, a positive and a greater integration and, and union between the two regions. Thank you so much, and, uh, and we really hope this uh, optimistic forecast will uh, come into fruition. Um, I will give uh, now uh, Ms. Thailand the floor to manage the questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the both of you. It was very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much, Nadav, for your um, hosting of the segment. Now we're not going to be, we're not going to be able to get to all of these questions, but I see some very uh, poignant questions being posed here. So I'm not going to ask the questions in the order that they have come in, but um, I would like to start with the question by Willard and uh, Ambassador Thomas uh, alluded to this in, in his, um, in, in his section, there's a strategic significance to the Abraham Accord and the forecast. And Willard asks, there's a lot of propaganda against Israel and as a result, the world seems, sees Israel as the oppressor. And he wants to know, is there a way that Israel can bring the truth of what is happening generally on the ground? And I want to add to that because we are here in the context of the Caribbean um, scenario Whereas we as Christians, we understand our relationship and the foundation when it comes to Israel. But when you dig deeper down into the con cultural construct, you see some uh, deviating to uh, this same very um, um, question here that is posed by Willard, where we understand our relationship with God and Abraham and Israel. But then the propaganda also plays a role in, um, in, in bringing a negative connotation to, to this question here is posed, how can we as Caribbean leaders, as pastors, as evangelicals, um, and both Ambassador Tal and Ambassador Thomas can speak to this, how can we as leaders, and evangelical leaders, upcoming pastors, how can we address this issue among the Caribbean um, congregation and even you know, Christian community throughout the Caribbean, even though we have, um, we are, you know, we support Israel. We still see some of this coming through that Israel is the oppressor. How do we deal with that in our congregations and as we, you know, speak at varying events? Okay, thank you. Um, we, my short answer is this, is that uh, we are going to have to control or take charge of the lobbying critical mass. <laughs> I always believe that it's a critical mass that determines the direction of, uh, of 
that it, critical mass controls the direction. I just really believe that. And uh, example, there are two areas, okay, that we need to actually have informed people and have informed people who are passionate about sharing the truth. And that is number one, in the media, and also number two, in the political arena. So these two areas, okay, we must make sure that the lobbying voices within the media, within the Caribbean media, and the lobbying voices within Caribbean politics are not indoctrinated with the anti-Israel agenda. Absolutely. And the only way that we can do that is by being informed and also participating in that world yourself. Like we have gone into the media world and, uh, and we are just going to say the truth. And uh, so I believe the areas of media and the areas of politics are areas where our voices have to be very strong and very loud. I mean, just to give an example, <clears throat> Global media is controlled by, I believe, 280 media executives. All the major media entities in the world, about 280 media executives, <laughs> okay? Now, if you have, so that's globally. So whatever political ideology, that group, the majority of that group subscribes to, is going to influence the tone of the news that, I mean, that they give. Now, it's the same for the Caribbean. So we have to influence the influencers in the media and influence the influencers in politics. And I believe we can do that. Okay, that's my answer. And I turn over to Ambassador Tart. Yes, sorry. Thank you, Ambassador Thomas. And um, I want to apologize. I failed, uh, Mrs. Highland, to um, thank you for your uh, uh, fantastic uh, job as a co-host this evening. So please let me repair that now and, and thank you uh, uh, graciously. Um, well, when it comes to the, the media, of course, that's the biggest challenge nowadays. Um, because it's not only the product of propaganda in many uh, cases, uh, it's uh, all about fake news. And uh, why is it a challenge uh, to Israel? Because we uh, pride ourselves in checking every bit of information uh, to investigate and inquire where... Um, uh, some uh, uh, deplorable facts have occurred and, uh, and we are losing uh, the battle of instant communication. Uh, we are aware of that, uh, but nevertheless, for us, the truth is um, uh, probably the, the biggest, uh, the most important value um, uh, that, that we have in our, in our arsenal. Uh, which is, of course, not the case uh, for um, our rivals and our and our enemies. Now, take for example what happened during uh, the last military operation in Gaza. There is a lot of bad faith. What uh, uh, we witnessed was a asymmetric uh, war or military operation between a democratic country and a terrorist organization. But looking at the coverage of the media, in many instances, what was reflected was a confrontation between the uh, military superpower, Israel, regional superpower, Israel, and the poor Palestinian people. And despite the fact that uh, all of us ambassadors, Israeli ambassadors and diplomats uh, and, and, and Nadav, uh, uh, gave many, many interviews. Uh, we uh, uh, tried to explain the facts. Nevertheless, um, uh, journalists um, and uh, 
uh, and, and observers um, uh, portrayed the, 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 the facts in, in a completely uh, different manner. So this is what we are up to. And, uh, and, and again, I, I agree with Reverend Thomas. We uh, need to, to target the influencers who are the, the ones shaping uh, the opinions. And uh, when it comes to facts, um, you can rely on us. Uh, we will submit to you the hard evidence and the facts as soon as possible uh, in order to uh, put the record straight. Great. Thank you, ambassadors, for your contribution to that question. Um, before we go on, um, earlier uh, we had a um, comment, well, a question, Apostle, he wanted to know, Ambassador Tal, if it is possible for that documentation of the dates and events which transpired um, in terms of the peace process, the first um, question that topic that we pose, if you can make that available to our participants, if that is possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. With great delight. Thank you, Ambassador Tal. Um, I want to switch over to a question that speaks to trade and uh, as part of the Caribbean Israel Leadership Coalition in you know, our daily um, contributions with our partners in Israel you know, with respect to trade, um, Dr. Thomas, Ambassador Thomas mentioned our agricultural um, projects and so on and so forth. But you mentioned uh, Ambassador Tal and there's a question from uh, someone here I believe based in the island of Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, she mentioned, uh, she is the manager of the water resources in Trinidad and Tobago. And she states that she knows about the Galilee Institute, but she's stating that it's costly. And so she wants to know how can we share a knowledge on, on climate change and, and water management, not only in Trinidad and Tobago, but in other islands of the Caribbean. Well, let me first uh, um, explain to you that uh, the Israeli Foreign Service has tried along the years to strengthen its relationship with the uh, Caribbean countries and with uh, CARICOM mainly. Um, and um, we tried actually different formats. Uh, the last one was through our um, uh, permanent uh, mission uh, at the UN uh, with someone um, who was uh, uh, specifically ch charged uh, with the dialogue with the uh, Caribbean nations ambassadors at the UN in New York. But finally, um, and if I may say so, I think that uh, my colleagues uh, got their act together and now um, all of that will be administered by our headquarters in Jerusalem and actually uh, in a few days time from now, a new um, department will be uh, created, will be operative and dedicated solely to the Caribbean. So uh, you can expect uh, foreign, uh, Israeli foreign ministry and the Israeli diplomats to dedicate uh, much more attention to the needs of the Caribbean uh, nations, the Caribbean countries, members of CARICOM. Come. And in order to promote um, uh, these exchanges, uh, whether it is in uh, agriculture, in cyber health issues, and what have you, uh, you have a few, uh, actually three ambassadors who are accredited to the different uh, Caribbean uh, countries. Um, in Panama, our ambassador in Panama, our ambassador in Santo Domingo, and, um, and myself. And um, we have also our uh, ambassador in Panama who is accredited to CARICOM. So I would say uh, that through these channels, um, and again, if you haven't any access uh, for the time being to my colleagues, I offer our good services. Um, we'll be able to, uh, to uh, um, uh, make sure that, that uh, there are exchanges in whatever area is of interest to you. 
uh, in order to promote uh, commercial exchanges, in order to uh, bring uh, uh, Israeli uh, technologies to the table and, and uh, solutions to the challenges that you face in, in the Caribbean. And a last word, a last word um, uh, of praise uh, uh, regarding my deputy, uh, Nadav Gorin, who's really uh, uh, making the uh, extra mile uh, in his uh, um, uh, dialogue with uh, the CARICOM uh, secretariat and uh, is really uh, helping us in fostering these strong relations with the Caribbean countries. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Tao. There's a very interesting question here, which is posed to Ambassador Dr. Thomas, and definitely would like to hear your take on this. And this comes from Carlton, and he says, Dr. Thomas, the forecast for Israel is for more and more nations to support Israel, but according to scripture, the nations of the world will stand against Israel. So how do we, in this particular dispensation, and in this season that we are in, how do you balance that against scripture? He says, how does this square with what we, uh, we want to achieve here? Okay, okay, that's a theological question. And uh, so I shall answer it in a theological way. Now, uh, in understanding any type of theological question, you got to understand now dispensations. And you've got to understand that for every now dispensations is what they call times and seasons. So there are times and seasons for different prophetic utterances to be fulfilled. They're fulfilled in their time and in their season. Right now, the, in the dispensation that we're in, right now, we're not in the dispensation whereby we're not in the period where we, we are approaching a period, but right now in this period and the hour that we're in, in the earth right now is that there is a window to have greater, greater union and, and partnership with nations within the Arab world. But as I said, it's gonna be two tracks. You're still going to have the agenda that's represented by Iran, that is represented by Syria, that is represented uh, by, by, by uh, uh, terrorist groups. You're still going to have that agenda. But on the other hand, you're going to have other Arab nations that break from that. So all we can do right now is to, uh, is to partner with who's available to, to partner with and defend against who is hostile. <laughs> okay, that's all these we can do, is, uh, is, is create more partnerships and defend and actually defend itself. And uh, so you, you, you always, you're always gonna have that, always gonna have that, yeah. Thank you, Ambassador Thomas. I don't know if Ambassador Tal wants to to that, but from a religious perspective, I, I leave. I leave that with the theologians. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness! Yes. There are some questions here that are more from the religious, uh, spiritual context, and I, I, I would like to submit that. Um, between Ambassador Dr. Peter Morgan and Ambassador Thomas can host a summit that can address some of these uh, questions that are more slanted on the religious side, because I don't think that this is the time and you don't even have the time to address these questions because they go very, very, very deep. We will be here for another two hours to address some of these questions. But um, I, I want to give the opportunity to um, a comment mentioned here earlier. Um, and this is for well, both ambassadors, but Ambassador Tal, you can open up by uh, addressing this question. And in, in, I believe it was in 2017 that um, President um, Trump recognized um, the Jerusalem as, as the, what you say, the state of, of Israel. Capital. Yeah, capital. 
And so I believe this question has to do with, with that. And so he has asked, Carlton has asked, how significant was the establishment of the US Embassy in Jerusalem? And, and, and I would like to add to that, very, if you can answer very quickly because of the time, how has that establishment between 2017 and 2018, when it was signed um, to now 2021, what fruit has it borne? Have you seen anything significant? What um, pass has it paid for um, the, these things that Israel wants to realize? And then um, segue into how it impacts the Caribbean, because uh, you are aware, we all are aware that not all of the Caribbean has supported uh, Israel. So where are we? with the establishment of the US Embassy in Jerusalem. If you can give us some insight, and then I'll pose about two more questions before we close this evening. Thank you. Um, I'll be brief. I uh, understand that uh, time is pressing and uh, we are approaching to the end of uh, uh, this uh, summit, this event. But of course, um, you'll easily uh, understand and, and, and identify, I guess, with the, uh, what I'm going to say for us, not only as Israelis, for the entire Jewish people and for the friends of Israel and, and the Jewish people, yourselves and many others, um, the uh, recognition by the uh, biggest superpower and Israel's closest strategic ally of Israel as the capital uh, of, of Jerusalem, sorry, as the capital of Israel was a historic um, decision uh, made by the Trump administration. Uh, imagine uh, Israel uh, is still, because unfortunately few countries followed suit and Israel is still the only country in the world uh, with no recognized capital, despite the fact that uh, more than 3,000 years ago, King David established uh, the Jewish capital in Jerusalem, and uh, there was a continuity of, of Jewish presence uh, in, in that part of the Middle East. And uh, all Jews pray facing the Western Wall in Jerusalem. So this is really central, central to the mere essence of Judaism, of the Jewish people. And we are in that respect, very thankful to uh, uh, former President Trump and his administration. And as I said, um, some European countries followed suit, uh, Hungary and the Czech Republic, uh, some African countries. Um, now we are talking about uh, uh, Colombia will be uh, opening an office on innovation in Jerusalem. Uh, we are waiting for Brazil, uh, Honduras and Guatemala, of course, have moved their embassy uh, to Jerusalem. It's not enough, um, but uh, this is unfortunately the reality we are still living in. Thank you, Ambassador Tom. Ambassador Thomas. Yes, well, I would like to say that uh, my prayer is that very soon we have at least one Caribbean nation that, uh, that has an embassy in, in Jerusalem. We're working on that behind the scenes. So uh, we're lobbying for that and we're working for that. So. So you just pray with us on that. We Be can pray one step at a time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Be praised in your efforts. Be praised in your efforts. May the day fruit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ambassadors. And just two quick questions. And if you can just um, speak to them very quickly so that we can move on to our next segment and then close. But um, it's more or less a, a comment. And this comment comes from um, Earl. And his perspective is that he says, it seems that the relationship between Israel and Egypt has been very positive over the years. 
is that a would you agree with that statement or are there more work to be done if you can just speak speak to that very quickly yes well um the uh, uh israeli uh, egyptian relationship has gone through uh, uh very challenging phases uh, you, you all remember the uh, Islamist uh, president of Egypt, Morsi, um, and before that, um, the uh, uh, first uh, Israel-Lebanese war and, and many other stumbling blocks in uh, our relations or tensions in our relations with uh, uh, neighboring countries and the Arab world. Uh, and still the uh, peace agreement resisted to all these turbulences and all these tensions um, as a gesture of confidence vis-a-vis -vis Egypt. We turned a blind eye when it came to um, uh, Egypt sending more troops, many more troops than agreed in our peace agreement in order to uh, fight the uh, Islamist terror organizations in the Sinai Peninsula. And, uh, and Egypt has always been very instrumental uh, when it came to uh, broker uh, settlements between us and Hamas. And uh, just uh, uh, today, there was a, a very fruitful uh, first encounter between Prime Minister Bennett and, uh, and uh, President Sisi. Um, so yes, indeed, uh, this is a, a cornerstone in uh, our relationship with the Arab world, the first peace agreement and with uh, one of the, the most uh, important Arab nations um, that uh, is, still, is still valid, still very solid uh, to this very day. Thank you, Ambassador Tal. Dr. Thomas, would you want to make a very brief comment on that or can we move on? No, I, I... I have always observed that uh, the relationship between Israel and, uh, and Egypt has been a cornerstone. And actually watching from afar, I've always, uh, I've, I've always actually noticed the intervention of Egypt when it came to peace, uh, particularly to ceasefires. And so I, I just endorse everything that the ambassador has said. Thank you, Ambassador. Unfortunately, I would not be able to um, pose any more of your questions, but what I can do, I have taken note of your questions and certainly um, Mr. Goren would be um, sure willing to answer those questions and we, we have your email list and we can always um, send the answers to those questions that we were unable to answer. Unfortunately, um, as I said earlier, questions that are more from a religious perspective, we will speak to that on a different um, platform at a different time. But what I want to do though, is to just uh, acknowledge some of the comments that came, came in. And uh, we have here by Anthony Young, he said, I think this is an opportune time for our region to deepen the ties with Israel, particularly as it relates to food security and water. And so, you know, that was the question, what are the channels to which we can faster enhance this process? Well, I would like to say to Mr. Young that Caribbean Israel Leadership Coalition has been taking the initiative and um, Ambassador Thomas, together with our VIP, our, our vice president in Israeli, our Israeli office has been championing um, trade between the Caribbean and Israel. And we, we do that daily opportunities um, for trade. So we, we can speak to that uh, as well and give you some more information. And you can specifically let us know what areas that you may be interested in because we do have a very thriving um, relationship with Israel and trade, especially um, with respect to agriculture and cybersecurity and other uh, industries. If you go on our website, you can see um, the areas and the industries in which we collaborate with, with Israel. So that is Caribbean Israel um, Coalition and I'll type it in before we close so that you can get more information as to the work that we do um, between Caribbean Israel Leadership Coalition and the Caribbean Israel Group from a 
trade perspective and the philanthropy and lobbying, et cetera. So the information is there and I will share it with you. Um, Andre says, I pray for the peace and prosperity of Israel and peace of Jerusalem. May all who love Israel prosper. Amen to that. And we have a comment as well from Ambassador Henry. He says, hi, your excellencies. Um, he wants to talk about what's Israel's position to defend Israel in the diaspora, especially the Igbos in Eastern Nigeria. Um, so there's a, a lot of uh, issues there and you can see that um, comment going up in the screen, but unfortunately we won't be able to address that. But uh, there was a comment that I'm looking for. Um, again, I uh, will pose this to Nadav, but he, this comment here is, the Caribbean nations are a plural society with Muslims in the Caribbean and there is the human rights organization, you know, as we mentioned earlier, accusing Israel of apartheid and including countries like South Africa. So these are very, very deep questions that unfortunately this summit will not be able to give full um, you know, address to. And I, I would hope that an opportunity would, be, would present itself for us to speak to these very pressing and deep questions that people also have pertaining to, to Israel. At this time, um, I want to thank Ambassador Dr. Andre Thomas and Ambassador Zavital for their enlightenment, enlightening us on these um, segments, the questions that were posed. And at uh, this time, what I would like to do is to just get a quick word from Ambassador Dr. Thomas and Ambassador Zavital on what then, looking at everything that we've spoken to here, what is the way forward for Caribbean and Israel relations, just to bring it all together and you know, let our, our participants know what is the way forward for Caribbean-Israel relations. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Jennifer. You've done a really excellent job in really hosting this. And uh, it's, it's, it's really great to see where we are. I really believe that um, we are in another phase of our relationship with Israel. I believe we're beginning a, another phase. And uh, within the first phase, where the phase that CILC was involved in, uh, we brought a lot of awareness of uh, strategic, of Israel's strategic interests to the region, we shared with every single nation within CARICOM how Israel could be an ideal economic partner. I believe that they've heard that message and I believe we now have an opportunity to execute that on a level that we've never had before. So for me, uh, and we've seen we've seen some nations actually totally change their Israel policy from negative to positive. We have one nation that definitely made a massive change. And I was within a meeting uh, with the Minister of Foreign Affairs and an Israeli government official. And as the Minister of Foreign Affairs was actually stating, we have totally changed our policy where Israel is concerned. And that was a product of lobbying. <clears throat> So I really believe that we are in another phase of our relationship. And in this phase, we're gonna see a lot more action. And the action is gonna crystallize the words that we've been saying, and it's gonna cause <clears throat> greater movement of the Caribbean towards Israel. There are many projects that we have on ground. There are so many projects that we're working on that I believe in the next year would be fulfilled. And, uh, and uh, we'll see greater, greater um, integration between the Israeli government and the Caribbean governments, but also Israeli civil society and Caribbean civil society. And so we want to have integration at those two levels. And I believe we're in another phase, where we're going to see a lot of action this is concerned. Yeah. 
Ambassador Tao, would you like to add to well, that? Well, uh, first of all, yes, very, very uh, uh, briefly. Uh, first of all, Mrs. Highland, again, thank you for co-hosting the event. And uh, let me uh, volunteer our services um, regarding uh, questions. Um, I saw also a question about the voting patterns of the different uh, Caribbean states at the UN. Uh, any any uh, uh, such question we could answer, uh, you could uh, direct it to our emails and then we can uh, send uh, our answers directly uh, to uh, the people who post them and not wait until the, the next event. Um, but um, regarding uh, uh, the closing uh, comments, I again couldn't agree more with Reverend Thomas. Uh, I think that we have now uh, switched to a phase in which we should address together um, practical issues. Uh, cooperation in the various uh, thematics that we have mentioned uh, this evening, but also confronting together uh, political challenges, whether, uh, as said, uh, voting patterns at the UN, but also, uh, for example, the upcoming conference uh, celebrating the 20th anniversary of the infamous Durban conference of 2001. On the 22nd of this month in New York, you'll have such an event. And we have been trying to convince uh, friendly countries to abstain and to not send any participant, even at a junior level, to such a shameful uh, conference. Um, so I believe that these are uh, um, um, crossroads uh, where we could join forces and make a difference. Absolutely. Thank you all for your support, for your kind words, for your love, for your strong belief in Israel and in the Jewish people and in the Jewish culture. Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much. Um, I will hand over to Leda Floren to make a few statements, his closing remarks, his thank you, and I will come back and officially close the summit 2021. So just really, I would like to uh, profoundly thank, first of all, our terrific panelists, Ambassador Tal and Ambassador Thomas for a really intriguing discussion. I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Morgan, Ms. Highland, thank you very much for all the work you put into this, to the Caribbean Israel Leadership Coalition, our great, great partner. And of course, to all of you honorable guests here present, we always value your staunch support for Israel, and we view this event tonight as an important step forward towards strengthening ties between Israel and the Caribbean Christian community. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nadav Boren. Thank you uh, as well. Um, I would also like to use, you thank all our panelists, and I want to thank all of them for joining us for this historical uh, summit between Caribbean and Israel uh, leadership Coalition and Israel and Caribbean Evangelicals. As I state, we look forward for an opportunity whereby we can expand more on the topics that we've addressed. And I, you can stay tuned to Caribbean Israel Leadership Coalition. And we thank you so very much for staying with us for the hour and a half. Your presence has been appreciated. We know that you could have been somewhere else, but we thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Ambassador Zavital. And thank you very much, Ambassador Dr. Thomas and Dr. Florian and Dr. Peter Morgan and my technical team, hardworking team behind the scenes, Pastor Amory Eversley and uh, uh, Elder Shaka for your commitment in helping us to produce this very uh, important summit. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us and we look forward to you joining us for our next Caribbean Israel Leadership Coalition Summit between the Caribbean evangelical, evangelical leaders and Israel. Good night and God bless you.